And today we are really pleased to have Chris Levitt with us. Um, Chris is from the Shaw Trust um, and he is going to talk to us about the Refugee Employability Programme or REP, as it's a little bit of a mouthful. <laughs> um, so just in terms of structure, uh, so we're going to have some time where Chris is going to present to us um, and then you can put any questions that you might have in the chat box as we go. Um, and then after Chris is presented, then we'll have time uh, where he can respond to those questions or I can respond to those questions um, if they're more ones for me. And we're going to try and keep to sort of an hour, hopefully, because um, I'm aware it's a, it's a Monday morning, but at the start of a busy week for everybody. Mm -hmm. um, so I think with that, we will I'll hand over to Chris. So Chris, thank, thank you. you so much for being with us this morning. Lovely. Yeah, thanks so much for having me and for all of you to giving up your time on a Monday morning, as Patty said. There's no, there's no winding down for Christmas this side, so um, we're full steam ahead for a couple more weeks. So lovely to meet you all. Um, <clears throat> apologies in advance if I go ever so slightly mute. It's probably because I will be either having a cough or a sneeze. I am battling a little bit of a cold at the moment. But I have got the the holy trinity of Lemsip water and a, t and a toilet roll nearby. So hopefully we'll get through. So any, any opportunities for Q&A, that would be great and give me a chance just to have a cough in the background before coming back to you. Um, but yeah, as Patty said, I'll take you through a little bit about the programme, a little bit about the support we provide now. Um, really informal. So yeah, do do um, come back with any questions or comments as we go through. We've got the chat function, we can do hands and whatnot, and we've got plenty of time to, to go through. So we're not in a big rush this morning. But yeah, hopefully I can tell you a little bit more about what we can do. And, and yeah, hopefully we can help the, the people in your community in moving forward. So yes, I'm from Shore Trust. For those of you who don't know, um, Shore Trust is a is a social enterprise company or an employability provider. So we have a number of different sort of government department contracts, um, all sort of linked towards supporting individuals. So we work in places like job centres, we work in prisons, probation services, children's homes, young families, careers advisors. So it's, a, it's a, probably one of the biggest organisations you may or may not have heard of. But um, yeah, we, we are here to tell you about a, a new programme or a newish programme, which has been funded by the government and in particular the Home Office. And it's a, a programme called the Refugee Employability Programme, or we call it REP. Um, and that is to support refugees, to, to help them to, to find work, find sustainable work and to integrate within their communities. So we'll tell you a little bit about how we do that as we, as we go through this morning. Um, Read in partnership, interestingly enough, are actually the main provider of this contract in London. So they were the, the successful bidder that was awarded the contracts in London. But what they did is then looked for companies that maybe had a, a bigger presence in different areas and boroughs. And that's where Sure Trust have, have joined the party. So we're delivering this service in 11 of the London boroughs. Um, all of you on the call, um, we cover your borough. So we, myself and Patty have sort of touched base on that already. And we're, we're very lucky and fortunate that it seems our geography lines align very much to, to yours as well. So that's worked out quite well that we've got consistency in terms of, of who's delivering the service. Um, it's a national contract as well. So it is for all of England. So what they have done is chopped England up into different regions and different companies will be doing the service in different areas. Um, London is its own region. And as I said, then between ourselves, um, Reed and, and Catch22, who are the three providers in London, we will be the ones providing the service. So let me tell you a little bit more about, I guess, the key objectives. So the, the, the main bread and butter, what are we here to do? The, the big ticket items, the big pledges is to support refugees into employment or self-employment. So that is what we are measured on. Our magic number is 90 days. So we can only sort of make a claim or, or record a successful outcome for a refugee that stays in work or self-employment for 90 days. If we're looking at um, self-employment, it's all linked to how much trading activity they do. And, and we would base that around, are they doing more than the national minimum wage across that 90 day period? So again, it all, all links to how much activity in trading, but supporting individuals to set up their own businesses would, would, would be part of this. And obviously helping people to, to find sort of PAYE or employment with, a, with an, another organization, obviously very much part of the, the service as well. Now, with REP, there is a lot of other services already supporting 
refugees and and that's been lovely to see since we went live um lots of councils authorities um charities organizations um job centers the list goes on so our role is to align with what's there we're, we're not here to displace people that are not um sort of in that in that um room we are there to to work with all of those partners and when i tell you a little bit about our case manager model i think what you'll you'll see hopefully is we are very much the the linchpin that can join those services together and, and the way our case manager model works and the, the intensity of support we provide uh, we can very much be that link between all those really valuable services that are all supporting that individual um, we will be delivering support in three different ways so i guess it's three strings to our bow and, and again as part of the service you will have sort of a mix and match depending on what you need um, but the three things that we will deliver firstly is employment support so we are an employability provider that's what we've been doing for for nearly 40 years now so we will deliver sessions on cvs on cover letters on mock interviews um, we'll be supporting people to access our national accounts all the employers we work with we have funding for things like training, for uniform, for travel costs. So all of that would sit under that employment support banner. So anything that can push that individual closer to finding work and keeping that job. So that's very much part of the service. The second part is our English language support or ESOL, as many of you may sort of refer to it more, more commonly. So English language classes. And again, we are delivering those. We have qualified tutors that are delivering those English classes. And the levels that we will deliver, we go right from pre-entry level. So we're talking people that cannot speak a word of English, can't count to five, can't tell you the days of the week. That's absolutely fine. We can work with individuals where their level is that low. And then we can work through each level, all through entry level one, two and three, through to level one and level two, which is a GCSE equivalent. So we offer ESOL provision across all of those levels. The way we do it is we have different classes in terms of intensity so we can run packages where people may come to class twice a week we may have people that come to class four times a week we have sessions that are delivered face to face in classrooms that we've rented in, in different locations we have sessions that are run over teams as well <coughs> apologies and um we will offer as i guess what's what's best for that person so based on everything else that's going on in their world the other levels of support they need, other services they may be accessing, we can come up with a, a package and an offer that suits them and, and make sure that they're in the right class, doing the right level of work um, and being supported throughout their time on rep. Now, the final thing we offer, which is definitely the most varied, but I definitely think is the most rewarding as well, is our integration support. So if we think of everything else that that individual may be struggling with, that would probably come under that integration piece. So ultimately we're looking at housing it's very prevalent at the moment we're looking at opportunities and scenarios and, and things we can do to support someone's housing um, needs and, and see if we can find them or help them to support and, and, and find secure accommodation we're looking at things like id documents opening bank accounts getting individuals registered with health services so gps dentists um, school places for children um, the list goes on financial status income expenditure absolutely everything that you can imagine that may be prevalent in that person's world so our integration team will then work to, to really look at those barriers and just make a case of, of removing those barriers one at a time um, and getting that person to a point where they feel a lot more integrated in their community now we also run integration workshops and, and they're just a joy to, to watch so we have a whole menu of of different bite-sized workshops that we run um, so we have a, a timetable where these workshops run from the offices that we work in and we can have sessions around anything really so we run sessions if for example in the last few weeks around what's the london underground what do the different lines mean how do i get an oyster card how can i register for a library card how can i go and see a gp um, what are the different supermarkets in the uk and their different price points all of these sort of individual workshops that that <coughs> someone who um is is new to the community new to the area um something that they're going to benefit from greatly what we've seen with those workshops is they are incredibly powerful in terms of bringing like-minded people together as well so we may have a room of 
different people, different nationalities, different races, different creeds, but they're there for the same reason. And actually what we've seen then is those events turn into more community events where people then converse and talk afterwards. They share lunch, they share food, and they're meeting other like-minded people that are, are in very similar situations. <coughs> Sorry, folks, I'm going to try and get through as, with as few coughs as we can. Um, we offer different support packages. And as I said, the packages there are, are depending on kind of the levels of intensity that that person needs. So we have a package A, which focuses on the employment support package b covers everything what we do see though is a huge amount of crossover so you may have someone that's predominantly focused on employment support but they may still need a little bit of esa or a little bit of integration um, if people are already being supported by esa then there's no requirement for them to do it again as part of rep so we don't sort of complicate things if they're already part of a college if they're already doing evening classes we're not looking to duplicate that but again we'll just look at each case as exactly that case by case. So are they being supported? If not, then we can put that support in place for them. Um, let's give you a few, I guess, headlines about the, the service overall. <coughs> so we went live on the 4th of September. So what are we now? We're in our fourth month. Um, we're here for at least two years. Um, so the contract's been signed for two years. There is a home office clause as well to extend it for another two years. So I guess after that two year period, there'll be a review of whether the service is valuable, doing what it should do. And then the, the offer is there for, for an extension as well. The service is completely voluntary. So people cannot be mandated to attend if they're part of a, a job center, for example. We can't see things like sanctions or benefit um, being affected depending on people's attendance. It's a completely voluntary service. What we do have is some incredibly high targets from the Home Office around keeping people engaged. So that brings a lot of pressure for us, but good pressure because it means we have to make sure the service is super helpful for, for, for people and they're getting something from every interaction, every meeting, every class. Because if people decide to drop off or people decide they don't want to come in anymore, that is a something we are penalised for by Home Office. So it's around keeping people infused, engaged, making sure what we are offering is exactly what they need. And there's a few things that we do to, to make sure that is the case. Um, we have a website which is live and it's accessible in multiple languages. There's a, an accessibility toolbar in there where people can switch the language, but the website is live. Um, it tells you all about the service. There's also space on there for people to refer. There's a box where they can fill it in themselves, provide a few details, and someone will give them a call. Um, likewise, you could be working with someone and you can fill it in on their behalf. And again, that uh, that person will get that call. Our turnaround time is really tight. We only have 24 hours as our target to, to call people back. So quite often, if people make a referral, they're called the same day to be invited to come in and speak to a member of the team. So that's all live. That's, that's good and raring to go. The telephone service does the same thing. So there is a phone number again, people can call themselves. People can be with someone calling on their behalf. They will connect with someone straight away. And that is the uh, the output of that being that individual then is, is booked in to, to come in and see a member of the team or, or that first appointment is set up. So these things are live. So if there's people you're working with now that you think, yes, this is going to benefit them, don't delay. Like we can, we can have someone call them today, tomorrow. Um, we can move very quickly on that. The next part is, is I guess, the bit that why we're all here on on, on this call to an, to an extent as well. Um, and that's looking at how we can actually bring the service to you and, and bring the service right to your doors, um, right to your communities to try and strip out as much of that referral process as we can and just get it to a point where you know exactly how you can access someone from, from the rep team. So if I give the example of, of maybe the job centre offices, because that's a model that we may look to, to try and mirror now with, with yourselves, is... We go to those job off centre offices every single week. We have a set day which is booked in and everyone knows that on a Monday, the rep team will be here between nine and five. And we have a diary and people can book people into that diary and you can set your watch. You know, we will always be there every week to work with whoever you would like us to work with. So I think that's the model we're going to look to try and finesse and, and, and iron out. And we'll have a little bit of time, I think, at the end of the call to, to maybe talk a little bit of the finer detail. But yes, we have the website, we have the telephone number, you can you can have someone access our service very quickly. But again, we want to be able to bring that right to you and bring that into the communities 
that you're already in and, and that refugees are already in and, and they feel a lot comfortable with. Um, our service is face to face. Um, we can offer digital appointments. We can offer telephone appointments. We get so much more from seeing that person in front of us. So that is what we, we strive to do for as much of the service as we can. So our team work from offices. We, we have around eight or nine venues in total that we work from. We also work from job centres, from libraries, from different community settings. We are mobile. We, we, we work from laptops. Um, we can bring the service to you. What we have done, though, is we also will go to communities, organisations that refugees are comfortable working within. So we've been to places of worship. We've been to mother and baby groups. We've been to refugee centres. Like we are happy to travel. We will go where people are able to be seen. So that's very fluid, very flexible. And again, the model will look to, to try and implement yourselves will be again, we'll bring that service to you um, and, and try and make that as stress free as possible for people to, to move around. If people are traveling to us, if they are coming to an office, if they're going to an ESOL class, if they're going to an interview, if they're going to see an employer, we will cover the costs of any travel as well, though. So we have a system in place. We would take their, their bank details and we would reimburse that individual within 24 hours. So um, as long as they've got a ticket or proof of travel, um, then we can. If they're struggling to pay up front, then what we can do is we can top up Oyster cards in advance and then they can use that to, to travel around. So we can get people where they need to go to attend appointments that are going to benefit them. But again, we will try and bring that service to them as well. Um, Refugees will get supported from a case manager, so they will be given a case manager on their first day and, and that case manager supports them for 18 months. So it's a it's a it's a long service. But again, I've, I've worked in this industry for about 15 years. A lot of contracts come and go. They're normally six months, nine months, 12 months. So actually to be able to work with someone for 18 months means we can make such a difference um, in terms of working with them. Now, our case managers are fantastic. Um, we are in a situation where we have a whole range of skills in the team. Many are learned experiences, have been asylum seekers, refugees in themselves, um, multi-diverse in terms of the languages they speak. And, and again, what we'll look to do is always what individual do we have? Who's the best case manager for them? We have case managers working across sort of set boroughs, but they normally work across two or three boroughs. So again, we can be very flexible in terms of, of how that looks. Now, the model, the case manager model is the bit that I just love. I, I've just fallen in love with this contract over and over because it's like nothing I've ever seen in, in this industry. So our structure in terms, in, in terms of how the Home Office want us to work is a case manager will work with around 30 refugees at any one point. Now, we have to work with those individuals at least every 10 days, 10 working days. So it's quite an intense service, but that's good. That means that people are being supported as often as they need it. They can access that way more than that as well. But as a minimum, we will always be looking to see that person face to face every two weeks. Now, with that in mind, obviously working with a, a caseload of around the 30 mark, it means that our case managers are seeing maybe two, three people a day. And that is it. So what is happening in reality is someone can come in for an appointment at nine o'clock and they can sit with that case manager if they need to for four, five, six hours at a time, if needs be. And that's been the thing that's just made me immensely proud to watch from offices and things where someone can come in who desperately needs help. They may be being bounced around different services. Services are saying to them, yep, yeah, I can offer you a 10 minute appointment. Then they're sending them away to say, go and do this, go and do this, go and do this. The difference with this team and this case management team is we have the time to sit that person down and do the things that they're being asked to do together. So we have individuals coming into the office and they will sit there and complete referral forms for housing organisations for hours on end. And they are sat next to a case manager, supporting them through those applications, pressing the submit button, making the phone calls, sitting on hold for as long as it takes. And, and that has just been the huge difference. And being able to see that happening every day in the office is just giving me such immense pride. Um, again, I've got examples of people that are coming in looking for work, but don't speak English, don't understand application forms. They're able to sit with a case manager. They may be discussing in their own native tongue or we might be using interpreters, but 
they're getting applications completed. Oh, what's happening there? What's happening there? I think I'm back, folks. Yeah. Lost your slides for a minute. Oh, they're back. <laughs> yeah, that was a weird. That was I just had a. Oh, Teams. I get a little Monday update. Clearly. What's the Teams doing? There you go. Leave me alone. Right. Let's close Teams down. I wonder if that's. Okay, I think I'm back. There we go. Lovely. Um, yeah, I guess it's the power of of having the time to to be able to do these things, and and I've seen it firsthand. And I don't blame other organisations like DWP and job centres. The, the, the way their diaries are structured is they can only offer five minutes, ten minutes here and there. So to be able to see someone come in and have that time to work with people is making a huge difference. I think I was sharing an example as well, as I said of a, of a an advisor working with a, a refugee that came in looking for work she was translating every question on an application form to that refugee using arabic they were filling in the forms together they were hitting submit that individual gets a call in the next couple of days to say yes come in for an interview and i, I sit there and think that's just not possible when people don't have the tools to do so or the time to do so so to be able to offer that it makes a massive difference i think one of the first slides i shared was around that joined up approach other services, other agencies. And that's why our case managers are key because there may be other experts. We're, we're not a housing association. They may be accessing services through a housing association, but we have the time to reach out to that housing key worker, to yourself, to their work coaches, and be that glue that, that works out, right, what's happening here? Who's supporting you with this? Who's supporting you with this? And, and bringing it all back into that that one-stop shop to, to push people forward. So it's hugely powerful but it's, it's making a huge difference thus far and and the transformation is 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 incredible and some people that we that we've been able to see that we've been working with already um we do a needs-based assessment so we spoke a little bit about that integration piece so that first meeting is a real deep dive for that person we may book a couple of hours and we will really get to know them so we complete that needs-based assessment which will cover the obvious things employment prospects job goals but it talks about everything else what's your housing situation what's your relationships what's your financial status all the things i spoke about id health bank accounts mental health that assessment drills down into all of those things so that what we are left with then is a real tangible action plan to work through and say this is what's important to this person and and it's not a one size fits all. It's not come and do your CVs because that's the first thing to do. Each person's going to be different. That assessment helps us to to really prioritize those needs. And, and again, going back to that voluntary service piece, we have to make sure every appointment is impactful. So that assessment really gives us that guide in, in how to work with individuals. Um, we repeat that assessment then every three months. So again, things are going to change. Someone we sit down with today, February next year may look very different for them. And that's why we repeat that assessment, just to make sure, again, what we're offering is always relevant to them. It's always current. It's always adding, continuing to add value. It's no longer out of date. Um, so again, that's that that assessment tool helps to, to manage that. Likewise, for, for our ESOL provision, then there's the language-based assessment that, again, repeated, well, completed at the start, repeated each three months. And, and again, it just, just makes sure that people are always in the right class. We may do an assessment to someone who's entry level one, who makes significant progress. So by the time we do their next assessment, we're able to move them up a few classes. What we don't want to do is leave people not feeling challenged, not feeling like they're progressing. So again, that, that assessment being repeated allows us to always make sure we're constantly trying to push that person to be the best they can um, in terms of using their language. We use a document called the Personal Development Plan that overarches everything that we do. So every meeting we have, the Personal Development Plan or the PDP comes out and we set actions. We might give actions for ourselves, for other people, for the service user or the refugee. They all feed back into that plan. So every appointment, we look at the plan, we do a review of what's happened since and then we go back again. <coughs> right, and then lastly, um, if an individual finds work, in work support kicks in. So we don't just say, thanks, off you go. Good luck. Um, in work support is available for six months. So it is imperative that when people make that step, 
we are there as their bridge to, to keep them in that job. So as soon as that happens, we move to a, a different type of model where we talk about their first paychecks and we say, are you going to be able to sustain yourself between now and your first paycheck? So what's your travel situation? Can we support you with your train fares, your bus costs, what uniform might you need? Um, is there any training you need to do, any certificates you need to have? It's all about keeping that person in that job. <coughs> Okay, a little bit about eligibility. <clears throat> now, what I would say is we are the gatekeepers. So to try and simplify it, Sure Trust will always do the checks about eligibility. So <clears throat> if you're not sure whether someone is or not, I would always say just pass the details on. We'll always give someone a call. We'll always talk about the service. We will establish whether they are or not. Um, right at the start of call, I talked a bit about Sure Trust overall. And we're in a, an incredibly fortunate position, particularly in London, where Sure Trust hold a whole range of different contracts that can help people. So we have this service, the REP service, which is just for refugees. But we have other services like the Work and Health Programme. We have the National Careers Service. So what we are finding is if we are talking to someone who isn't quite eligible for REP, we don't put the phone down and say, see you later what we're able to do is go right well what we can do is find you a service that will be able to support you so again i would always say if you're not sure if you're finding eligibility is a little bit of a, a minefield or you're not quite sure whether they are or not just pass the details because we will contact that individual make sure they are helped by some form of service in one shape or another but in terms of this contract in terms of rep they must be settled they must have settled refugee status and that's probably the big one so if they are an asylum seeker if they are awaiting a decision at that moment in time we can't support them on rep what we can do is give them all the information about the service and when they get their decision they're able to then join so there's there's still a lot of value in, in giving people the details contact details letting them know when rep may or may not be in your venue so that they know they can access the service in the future but for people to go through the service they must have that settled status <coughs> now in terms of evidence in that they need their brp card so that's all they need to show us their brp card which will say on there you have the right to live, remain or live or work in the uk they may or may not be an expiry date or it might say indefinite but that brp card is the check that we do to make sure that they are eligible for the service so they must be in possession of that brp card in terms of the other eligibility criteria, they must be working age. So it's a contract that wants to help people find work. So they must be 18 up to retirement age. And there must be a desire to want to find work. Now, we don't expect people to, to want to go to work straight away on day one. Um, <clears throat> we're very aware housing is very much people's priority whilst it's not secured. But that's fine. We have 18 months to work with people. We're not looking for them to find a job on their first day. So if it takes us six months to find secure housing, it takes six months to find secure housing. We can look at employment after that. So, a, But there has to be that willingness to begin with at the start. So as long as they say, yep, yeah, look, in those next 18 months, I'm thinking about going into work. Absolutely fine. Um, they must be, they can't be a full-time work or full-time education. If they're in part-time, that's fine. But it has to be less than 16 well 16 and a half so 16 hours or less they must be doing either work or education so as long as they are only in part-time that's fine if they are full-time for either unfortunately they won't be able to do rep um, and then for some of the schemes so in the green box on the right there you've got seven resettlement schemes or programs or packages they have to have joined or, or arrived in the uk under one of those schemes now probably 95% plus of what we see is the refugee permission to stay which is the one that says you have the right to stay here's your brp card there's your date you were given a site um given status off you go so most people are going to arrive under that scheme <coughs> we have got some schemes for afghan nationals only but a lot of those now are maybe sort of winding down and, and more and more we're seeing are coming through just under the permission to stay likewise people can access through family reunion or maybe sponsorship schemes as well but there are seven in total they must form part of one of those there is probably one <coughs> glaring omission 
which is the Homes for Ukraine scheme. <clears throat> and again, the reason why that is missing is because there is a similar service to REP already set up for that cohort of people. So what the Home Office don't want to do is duplicate. They want to direct people that are accessing the Homes for Ukraine scheme through the, the, the relevant employment schemes that have been set up for, for that cohort. But again, everyone else we expect will now sit under under rep. But again, if you're not sure, eligibility can have its little intricacies. Pass the details. We'll make the calls. We'll check whether people are eligible or not. <clears throat> and then lastly, a little bit about geography. So um, we are delivering rep all across London. And uh, Reed, as I said, are the, the main provider. Their offices are predominantly in the south. So that's where they've chosen to, to be the provider in the south. We have Catch-22, similarly, who tend to be working in the east. Shore Trust have got maybe the biggest patch. So we've got the, the central, the north, and the west. So you can see the 11 boroughs that we're covering. You can see the crossover in terms of the boroughs that yourselves are, are based. And you can also see that our boroughs are all very much neighbouring, which is which is very useful. So, um, yeah, you can see right up to sort of west, you've got your Hounslow's, Hillingdon's, sort of northwest in your Brent, and going round to, to north Barnet's, Enfields and then sort of coming into city, we have a and Fulham's, uh, Royal Borough, Kensington, Chelsea's, Westminster's, etc. So we have an office in most of these boroughs. Um, I think the only one we don't at the moment is Ealing, but we are almost there with Ealing. We have big offices in Shepherd's Bush. That's our big hub office. Um, as I said, we work from other buildings in those other boroughs. We work in the job centres. We work in the libraries. We work in many other community settings. So people in those boroughs don't have to travel very far to come and see us. Or, as I said, we'll hopefully move to that model where we completely bring the service to you. Um, people can be seen wherever they want to be seen. So it's completely up to the service user. So, again, we may find you have someone who lives in Ealing but actually has family in Redbridge. And they prefer to be seen in Redbridge. That's absolutely fine. So the three the three partners all work very closely. We're all part of daily calls where we're discussing the program and contract. So people can move between the three. And the service is delivered exactly the same way by all three partners. So there is complete crossover in terms of what the service is like in each borough. It's delivered exactly the same. So there's no no one feels a, a bump if they have to move and we see that we work we work with people in some of the bridging hotels and the temporary accommodation and then they have to move and they change boroughs and actually what they get then is that continuity in terms of who they're working with elsewhere so just to, to put your mind at ease for that one um that's grand that's the end of my slides i did um i'll come back to you guys on screen just see if we've got questions and stuff and um, patty is fabulous because what she sent me before was a list of questions she expected to be asked. So I'm going to run through those as well, because um, it may help to to answer some of the questions that will preempt some of the questions that we may be getting. Thank you, Chris. And you've done a very good job with a very oh, good bless. So yeah. we're very oh, grateful well, that you've made it despite. Um, <laughs> I was just going to get to one of the questions I sent Chris, which I know I've had a few conversations with people already. So I guess. As Chris was saying, one option for churches is we can just refer people in or they can self-refer in. So that's always an option. What we were looking at as well, though, was um, just in view of, you know, our churches, we're, we're clergy and volunteers, we're not caseworkers. And I think what a lot of church communities are finding really challenging at the moment is sort of almost needing to step into some of that casework piece because the, yeah. all the organisations are so stretched at the moment. But, you know, we don't have a background in that. And so looking for someone that we might be able to partner with on that. So what we were talking with or I was talking with Chris about a couple of weeks ago was whether we might have caseworkers sitting in some of our churches across the diocese, perhaps on certain days of the week. And I know that from a few of you who've emailed so far, you would be interested in that. So I guess just in terms of initial couple of questions to, to kick us off with Chris around that would be, if we were looking at, say, in one of our churches here today, having that casework support in a church, how many refugees would you need to be on that one day in able to make it kind of worthwhile in terms of yeah. the casework support? And just on the other side of that, what would a church need to provide in terms of either physical infrastructure or yeah. administrative support, perhaps in terms of booking people in or things around that, if they were to, to offer themselves as that sort of base. Yeah, perfect. Okay. Um, 
so we I said what we need is somewhere for two people to sit down and have a conversation in terms of infrastructure so we don't need anything fancy just a comfortable area for two people to sit so a table and two chairs would be absolutely fine um like maybe a maybe a bit of heating or something won't go amiss but I'll, I'll leave that up to the case managers um we have all the equipment we have the laptops so we will come along and we have all the wi-fi's and whatnot so we don't need any of that but if you have it it's helpful uh, but yeah i guess a comfortable space with an element of privacy because sometimes the conversations can can veer off into different different topics so yeah i guess a little bit of privacy would be absolutely fine um i guess the, the team work normal business hours so nine to five so we're not looking for weekend engagement or evening engagement i'm afraid so it would be between sort of core business hours we would, would typically book um probably an appointment we would space them out at an hour and a half intervals so when we are sort of if we go to a job center for example we might book a nine o'clock a 10 30 a 12 o'clock and then a, a 2 30 and a four or something like that so we can probably go for five appointments in a day is quite comfortable i guess it allows a little bit of flexibility and fluidity if people need a little bit of extra help we can call the next person and say look we're running a little bit late or yeah it just, it just means the caseworker finds that balance between sort of not being overly overly sort of burnt out in the day so probably five a day is a magic number um but four would be fine as well three or four would be fine um i guess that can be timed by the number of case managers so we're in a quite a, a flexible position as well as i say where we have a team of about 25 case managers um that will be going up to about 35 and by, by the start of february they're not particularly utilized it's quite a new contract still there's still a lot of raising awareness so caseload sizes are kind of between 10 and 20 at the moment so again if you have spaces where you think i could have 10 people come easily well then we'd provide two case managers on that day so we've got that flexibility outside to to kind of meet the demand of, of each one of your communities and, and, and venues um booking process I suppose the best scenario for us is we know who we're expecting to see in advance and we know the names. So what we provide for job centres, again, as, as an example, is a little table where we ask them to populate, which just has the list of the times. And it's the person's name, the person's phone number, and whether they may or may not need interpretation services. So we just ask for a comment around, I guess, their ability to converse or, or language. Those three things are it, because what we will always do then is call ahead and say, um, how are you? We're sure trust. We're coming to see you on this date, this time. We check the eligibility there and then. So we'll ask questions around their status, BRP. I, I suppose establish that they are able to join the service. We'll talk a bit about how they're planning to get to the appointment. We'll talk about things like travel costs. We take them through the process of being able to reimburse if they need to. So we do that pre-call. We call it a welcome call. And that's just a very soft, we're looking forward to seeing you. But at the same time, it gives us, I guess, a little bit of confidence and security that we know that person's going to attend. Um, so what our case managers would, would probably do is we'd, we'd want to identify someone your side where we will reach out to you probably twice a week and just say, what's the diary looking like for the next visit? And and that acts as our sort of natural prompt. So we, we actually put it in our case manager's diary as a recurring reminder to say, just send send Chris an update, what's going on? And we'll see, that I suppose the diary grows as we go through the week. Um, so that's perfect for us. I, I guess what that means is we can come back to you if we know actually someone isn't eligible. So we've got the time then in advance to say, look, unfortunately this person is not. So that spot's become available again. Um, and it really helps us with language. And I know that was one of Patty's questions as well. So that's a lovely segue. Um, we have translation services available. So within the case managers themselves, we're incredibly fortunate that within a team of 25, I think bar a couple, they're all multilingual. So we have a, a, a it's like a United Nations of languages available within the team itself. So knowing what we're potentially expecting in terms of who's attending helps us to make sure the right case managers are, are going to be in attendance to, to to make sure that conversation is happening i guess as seamlessly as it can um we also have translator services available though and so we can have someone available on the phone who we can sort of bring to the meeting have them on speaker they can act as that that um, conduit for that appointment 
We can do that via Teams as well. So we may have the translator on the screen in front of us on Teams. We can even ask for a face-to-face -face appointment. These things um, cost money. We have got money for them. Um, it's a cheaper rate for us if it's pre-booked. And that's why we love to know who are we expecting, what languages are we expecting, because we will get all these things pre-booked in advance. So you may have a Farsi speaker that's going to struggle to communicate in English. If we know we're seeing them at one o'clock on Friday, we can contact now and have that Farsi speaker available for one o'clock on Friday. And, and the rate is considerably reduced for us versus getting someone on demand on the day. So we always prefer that pre-call. So in terms of the administrative, um, I suppose, requirement, your side, yes, yeah, someone that can tell us this is what the diary looks like a couple of times a week is probably it. We can, we take care of the rest in terms of those pre-calls and, and working through who's who's what. Um, the I thought the last point P Patty sent across as well was just a bit, and I think we covered it in the presentation. So it's it, I suppose it's about emphasising that is we're not silly. We know that a lot of people it's housing, and and until that is sorted, they're not even entertaining the idea of employment. They're not entertaining the idea of training. That's fine. As, as I suppose the, the length of service that we have on rep is, is considerable in terms of 18 months and then an additional six months for those that find work. So quite a lot of, of our caseload at the moment, that's all we are doing is, is just housing support, housing advice, housing referrals. And we will get to that point of employment down the line. But it's again, it goes back to that needs based assessment. It's what's the biggest priority for that person at that moment in time. So I suppose, again, a little bit of security. If you have people that say, well, I don't want to engage with an employment program. It's not just an employment program, though. It really is scooping everything up and, and being that that conduit that that if they need to focus on housing to begin with, that's what we'll focus on then for, for the foreseeable until we get that stability in place. So, um, so yeah, it's it's that's us i think in a nutshell yeah we, we're we kind of ready to go as well so yeah we can have people in your venues from next week um we, we're here this week we're here next week we have a i suppose a skeleton service over christmas and new year um and then we're back on the 2nd of january so yeah we, we're kind of open to to how you think you can work with us and i know i think we were going to spend a little bit of time sort of hopefully looking at that as well before we, we jump off. But yeah, any other questions or, or comments or Yeah, exactly. I was gonna open it out and see yeah. if um perhaps if we do sort of the little raised handle raise your hand. Yeah. And then we know who's got any questions. A little, a little notification um, in the chat is that we've had questions. Yeah through. Mike I think has a question. Yeah I've, I've oh, right. had uh probably about a dozen members of our congregation who have previously uh, been in contact with Short Trust. Unfortunately, none of them were eligible at the time. Um, I'm struggling to know which of those people are getting through the process and are now eligible. I'm just wondering whether the team at Shaw have follow-up calls with, with people that they come across yeah. you know, every month or something just to check in with them. Because yes. uh, the, the, with, that, with that first experience being a no, you're not eligible, Unfortunately, I think some people have written it off as being unhelpful, which is a shame, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think, um, yeah, there's a few things there. So, so yes, ultimately, if people are not eligible at that point in time, we keep the details. We have a, a central-based call centre team who, whose role is to then, yeah, go back over. Has, has your circumstances changed, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I suppose the unknown bit is knowing when that decision is going to be made. So it's one of these, we will call you once a week, once every two weeks. We'll agree that pattern of call just to see if your circumstances have changed. So yes, that is happening in the background. We do then get people that say, yep, I've got my decision now. We're good to go. I suppose what we want to get to with the venues as well is that people that might not be eligible at that point, if they know that rep are going to be here on a Monday, and I want to come and talk to someone or they want to come and hear about the service. They've got those details themselves then. And, and I know everything else maybe takes priority when they get that decision because there's other more immediate pressing matters, normally housing. But I guess we well, want to get to that point where people know once they've got that decision, okay, I'm, I can call these people now. So I think a little bit is about education, raising awareness as well. Um, I, th I think these things take a little bit of time naturally to, to build so we want to get to that point where we want to get those weekly visits so that again everyone always knows that guy said he could help me when i get my decisions they're always here on a monday if i come down on a monday someone's yeah. going to be there to see yeah, them. I agree. Okay. so i think a little bit it's, it's just it has to just get that continuity in place and people know lovely right that's where to go um i suppose we want to 
we never want to say no to anyone really though so if we have people that are under that asylum seeker banner then for me the national career service needs to be a, a natural extension of that so yeah disappointed if people are potentially giving feedback that they've had nothing because what we should be doing is that natural signpost to say well, we can't help you but our friends at the table next door can so yeah no one should leave having encountered sure trust with no help whatsoever so and again i think once we're in that point of of stability in terms of how often we're visiting what that looks like the continuity in the days of the week is we may bring actually some of those other contracts to be part of that that forum and and I guess widen that piece, but again, those pre calls in advance is is spot on. And I, and I think I know in your venue in particular, Mike. We we did a bit of a drop in, didn't we? We we just came yeah. and saw who was there. And I think if we know who we're expecting, and we've been able to make those calls in advance. What we don't do is have anyone make any wasted journey because if they're not eligible at that point, we've had that conversation. We've done that, letting them down gently, but referring them to something else. What we don't have then is people coming in for no reason, which I know would leave a little bit of a a sour taste so yeah we're really keen to do those welcome calls in advance so a little bit of support in terms of knowing who to expect using that that booking system would would really help with that okay uh, thanks hey hello um firstly i'm just just for comments like i'm really encouraged by this i think oh. it seems like a really well developed sort of program especially the like um the length of time yeah. that you journey with them, the length of time that you spend with them in the sessions, the bespoke nature of it, all of it seems like it's also potentially like quite a humanizing experience as well, beyond the actual like practical skills of like getting them into work and integrating just the the nature of how it's um set out. Um, I just yeah. think it's really, really good. I feel really encouraged by um the presentation. So thank you. Um this is this is like um I think you kind of covered this in terms of like all the different boroughs, but where where we're at, we're in like King's Cross, so we're like super central in, in Islington, kind of Camden as well. We're sort of in between, but um, we will have lots of people that will get status. We're close to lots of the contingency hotels, um, and we'll be we're at the moment housing is the big thing, so helping people get get settled into housing. A lot of them don't end up in Islington, some do, but a lot of them will still return to King's Cross, whether it's for like ESOL classes, yeah. our football, games, yeah. cafe, other drop-in things. How would that work if they're still yeah. consistently coming to Islington or King's Cross, but they might be living a little bit outside, some of them maybe like Hackney or... Yes, yeah, so we, the three providers in London, we all use the same system. So if I'm yeah. Tom... I don't know, no, if I'm Joe Bloggs from Hackney and I move to Islington, my Islington case manager could still look up Joe Bloggs on the system and see all the notes that the Hackney person left when they were working with them. So transferring is as simple as, yeah. hi, mate, do you want to pick up this yeah, file for sure. me? Um, yeah. it's, it's really quite simple. I guess the, the premises, we have different locations. Again, the service user will always get told, you could be seen here, 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 here. Some may prefer the continuity of, oh, I know that place. I've been going there up till now, so I'll keep going there. We reimburse the travel so there's no skin off our nose. If they now move area and want to go somewhere closer, absolutely fine. Um, again, ESOL very similar. We, I, I'm thinking we've got big classrooms in Victoria. If people carry on because they like the tutor and the class they're in and they want to carry on going, that's absolutely fine. They don't have to be seen in the borough where they reside. They have the flexibility of being able to move across. Likewise, it's a national contract. So if they move that little bit, further out if they're in Staines or Maidenhead or Windsor or something which moves into Berkshire or something else again we just contact the provider in that area and well again we'd ask the service user first do you want to carry on traveling in to see us or do you want to go and do something on your doorstep but the service is national in England so they will always get the support for that 18 months as long as they stay in England um, if they move to Wales can't help them I'm afraid but yeah very very rare but um, so yeah, the, the, it's quite seamless that transfer piece. As I say, we're we're, we're seeing that a lot. Um, mm. You spoke about the temporary accommodation. Good good chance to sort of tell you that as well. That with most of those hotels, so I think Shaw Trust, we're in around forty of them. Where again, we have a member of the team that goes in, runs a forum, runs a sort of a, a drop in or clinic. So a lot of those people, by the time it comes for decisions to be made, they are already aware of who we are. I, go, I suppose what we're finding is 
most people, I say most, are, are asylum seekers at that point, but it's about raising that awareness, educating them that this service is available for you as soon as you get your decision. So then actually, if they're then engaging with the church when they've got their decision, that, that quite often there is already a little bit of an awareness about who we are and they think, yeah, yeah, I do remember that. I remember seeing the leaflet or seeing someone. So yeah, I guess we're very fortunate. The partners all work very closely. It's all very... Um, so it's interlinked there's no delays on transfers it's not waiting lists and things like that it's as simple as pressing a button on the system and they move from one office to another and sending someone a team's message or a phone call to say yeah can you pick this file up for me and i've booked them in your diary for thursday it's it's yeah it's very seamless in terms of working across all those boroughs so yeah great Good. Good. i think Thank there you. was a question from um let's have a look. Sarah, did you want to ask it or shall i Ask that question. I might ask it. So this is um. So just to sort of contextualise this a bit. Yep. So for some of the hub spaces that we're potentially looking at, there are already refugee drop-ins or okay. asylum seeker drop-ins there. Right. So there's a sort of you know people that we are already in contact with. For some of our churches, they would be really happy to host a drop-in space. Some of them are in really good um you know locations. Um. But they don't necessarily have that pre-existing work with refugees and asylum seekers. Um, so if we were talking about those churches, I guess two parts of the question, um, is it possible to host those as a space and then are there sort of materials that they can use to advertise the service to people or to advertise that through other churches or would you be able to sort of refer people into that space from the context that you already have? Yeah, absolutely. So um, let's start with materials. We have electronic versions. We have physical versions. We have leaflets. They come in 10 different languages. Um, if you want some, shout. Someone will come out and deliver you a batch. Um, you can put them up wherever you see fit. You can give them out like sweets. I don't mind. Um, we have lots and lots and lots. So lots of material about the program itself. Um, yeah, I guess if you've already got a system in place let's say i don't know tuesdays between 10 and 12 you have four or five other partners that will come in then maybe we start with saying well we'll come in up during that time if, if we're not able to actually conduct those appointments during that time i suppose what we can always do though is take names take phone numbers arrange other times for people to be seen they so it still acts as a conduit for them joining the service so that's fine we can provide people to come along to those if you already have those I suppose, routine forums in place. Um, yeah, I guess the other thing is we have all those other locations and buildings we use. So whilst we want to try and bring it to you and bring it to spaces that refugees are comfortable and they're already accessing and they already feel, I'm okay traveling here, I know where I'm going, they've got that, that comfort. What we can do though is have a conversation with someone and say, well, we do have an office a couple of minutes down the road. Do you want to come in and be seen in there? So I guess all options are on the table really, Patty. It's, it's, I think that's the beauty of a starting point is is we can kind of do whatever you like. All, all I know is we've got a lot of staff that we can put wherever you want them to, to go, really, and see as many people as you want them to see. So, yeah, I guess whatever. If it has to be different for different sites, fine. Like, we'll, we'll make that work. Um, I think what I'd be keen to do when we're in that point of things are in place is we have calls like this and we do that with many of our other partners where we just check in every month or six weeks and just say everything okay in your world everything okay in my world we share feedback um so that's probably something i should have should have mentioned as part of the presentation is friday is our feedback day so if you've made referrals into the service what we do is we track where they've come from so that's why we're quite keen to know who referred them and sometimes when people self-refer that gets a little bit tricky to to work out so if we know you've sent us a diary of five on a friday you'll get that update that says here's what happened with those five um, and then the following Friday, you get a, 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 a live update on what's happening with those five. And, and the list just gets bigger and bigger. And, and that's where we're at with the DWP offices, for example, is they give us names every week. And then they get on a Friday, here's a list of all the people that you guys have sent us contract to date. Here's what's happening with them. Um, I suppose that helps us to pinch any blocks in the in the pipe. If we had somebody who's maybe not come in for a couple of weeks or... We haven't seen them or they've stopped answering their phone it gives us that chance to give you guys a bit of feedback to say well if you see them before us let us know and then i suppose stop anyone potentially dropping out that we don't want to so 
yeah, feedback's a massive part of that as well. So I think that the, the diarized appointment booking process is probably preferred for that reason, just so that we can give you a little bit more visibility as well in terms of how your referrals are progressing. Because nothing helps to promote it than good news stories that you can share back around where you are. And, and yeah, we, we love doing it at the moment. People are finding work and we're able to say, yeah, this guy's working now. And in turn, that gives you something else that you can discuss as part of those those community settings and groups. So. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Chris. Um, I'm just aware of time because I did say we'd keep it to an hour. Um, <laughs> what I say is, I know some of you were thinking about being hub spaces already. I just wanted you to have a chance to hear from Chris sort of exactly what that might entail. Um, so what I'll do, I'll, I'll send out an email to everyone afterwards. If you're still interested in that, there'll be a sort of, are you still interested? Let me know. And then we will probably link you directly in with um, Chris's team to work out the kind of logistics around that. Where we've got a couple of churches that, that like they're in a similar area, I might get you to talk to each other and work out, you know, would you each do you know, would one of you do that space or would you share it between you um, just so that we're not sort of duplicating if it's, a, you know, quite close um, in terms of geography between churches. Um, if you've got more questions, then please just email them to me and I'm, I'm being in contact with Chris on those. Um, I'll also try and get as quick as I can edited out the recording. So if there's people in your teams that would like to watch back and haven't had a chance to, I'll try and get that out if I can by tomorrow um, so that they can uh, watch the recording as well. Um, I think that's probably everything. Have I missed anything, Alison? No, hopefully not. So um, thank you for your time this morning. Really appreciate it. I know it's always hard to find at the start of the week. So, and um, yeah, I will drop you all an email uh, later as well. Um, I'll also send through um, just more of the leaflets and stuff if, if we missed any of those with anyone. So thank you ever so much for your time this morning. And thank you, Chris. We really appreciate yeah. your time, particularly with um, not feeling <laughs> feeling under the weather as well. It's, so thank well, you ever so much. Just a bit of man flu. Just a bit of man flu. <laughs> Sounds a bit more than that, but <laughs> yeah. lovely. Thanks. Uh, lovely to meet you all, guys. I'll uh, hopefully be in touch with you all soon. Thank you.